overwhelming thing I hear all the time. It's never too late to do something that you're passionate about, something that you want to do. You can accomplish anything at any age. And if you try it at a more advanced age, all that wisdom and experience and passion that you bring to that launch, that's just so valuable. Deborah Evans Price is a trailblazer in the world of journalism and storytelling. She captures the essence of artists and their stories with depth and insight. From her early days as a music journalist to her acclaimed book, Country Faith, she's witnessed the evolution of country music and has been a driving force in shaping its narrative. A beacon of inspiration for those seeking to pursue their passions, no matter their age, she embodies the essence of squeezing the day and embraces every opportunity, overcoming challenges to leave a lasting impact. In this podcast, let's delve into the life of Deborah Evans Price, exploring moments that shaped her, the wisdom she's gained, and the insights she offers to those embarking on their own paths of discovery. We're glad you joined us to hear these inspiring stories from older adults, people who have so much experience and words of wisdom to share, but are sometimes overlooked in society today. I'm Sally Hussey, the CEO of 50 Forward, a Nashville-based nonprofit. Our mission is to support, champion, and enhance the lives of those 50 and older. And I'm Susan Sizemore, your guide through these beautiful conversations with those who are living life to the fullest and who know how to squeeze the day in their second chapter of life. Now in my second chapter and Encore career, I'm following my passion for sharing the stories of older adults with you and with the world. If you like what you hear, please rate and follow Squeeze the Day on your favorite podcast platform. Today's Squeeze the Day is brought to you by the All of Us Research Program from the National Institutes of Health. Learn how you can help change the future of health by participating in the program. Visit www.joinallofus.org to learn more. Deborah, welcome to Squeeze the Day. Thank you so much for having me, Susan. I am so honored to be here. I love what you do. This is just such a a positive thing for the community. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Well, it's it's my pleasure, and it's kind of a, an interesting story that we have known each other probably for 30 or so years, but have not kept up except via Facebook. So this is a good opportunity to let the world know about you, about your inspiring story, and the cool things you're doing um, in your not really second career, but second chapter of life. Thank you. I tell you, I am blessed. I wake up every morning just wondering what God's going to do next, what door's going to open. And after all these years, like I moved to town in 1980, the fall of 83. So I've been here 40 years now doing this. And I'm just as excited as I was when I started. So let's start with that. You're a well-respected journalist, and the list of people that you have interviewed in the entertainment industry is so vast. How did you get started? Really, it it goes all the way back to middle school. Like, I was one of those kids that was always on the newspaper staff. I was the editor-in-chief of the newspaper in high school. I was on the college paper. I just am fascinated by people and have been since I was a child. Like, I just love asking people where they're from, what they do. And so that just parlayed into wanting to be, become a journalist. And initially, I wanted, like, when I was in high school, we had a, a guy that was on the White House press corps that wow. had traveled with the president, and he came in and spoke to our journalism class. So initially, I wanted to go into hard news. I thought, yes, I want to do what he did. I want to travel the world and, you know, do all these exciting things and get to the root of every story. But I did an an internship at a television station when I was in college. I had to go to a shooting. I had to go to a car wreck. Like, after just a few days, I thought, God made people more emotionally prepared and stronger to handle hard news. I thought, I'm not sure that I want to do hard news. And at the time, I was working at a radio station as a country music disc jockey. And so that's kind of what led me into the country music career. Like, I knew I always wanted to be a journalist. But the country music route just came about. I was, you know, working my way through LSU and uh, had this great radio job that I worked overnight so I could go to classes during the day. And while I was there, I started writing for the local newspapers, like Kenny Rogers would come to town, Dottie West, the Oak Ridge Boys. And at the time, you know, the 
daily papers were just like overwhelmed, you know. So they were happy to have some little cub reporter that wanted to do the story, and I would get freelance assignments. And at the same time, I had a friend that was doing a public affairs talk show called Let's Talk, and we covered a variety of different topics from the local, you know, blood bank and, you know, encouraging people to do blood donations. And so it was, the TV show was all over the place. But my goal before I moved to a bigger market, I wanted people to be able to see me on TV, hear me on the radio, and read me the paper all on the same day. <laughs> Looking back, I was an overly ambitious, <laughs> you know, but I just thought I didn't want to stay in Shreveport. I wanted to go to either Nashville, New York, or L.A., and I wanted to have as, as much experience under my belt before you know as I could before I got there. Boy, those are lofty goals at a young age. And <laughs> where actually were you born, and kind of where did you have those real early formative years? This is a part of my story I love. I'm an Air Force brat. So Ah. I was born in Richlands, Virginia, but we lived all over the world. New Jersey, Georgia, Arkansas, Japan twice. As a matter of fact, I went to four high schools in four years. That's I started my freshman year in New Jersey, and then they transferred us back to Okinawa, Japan for the second time. And then we went from there to East Tennessee, and then from there to Bossier City, Louisiana. And the the when we got orders to go back to Japan, I had been in the the school system in New Jersey for four years, longest we lived anywhere. And I remember whining to my guidance counselor about you know this is because it was the end of my freshman year. I thought I don't want to go somewhere and start all over, and you know I'm just like oh you know it was just going to be so hard to leave all those friends. But he told me he said I know you want to be a writer. And if you want to be a writer, it's circumstances like this that will make you better at it. And looking back, he was right. Because you learn, you know, all that moving around, you learn to make friends quickly, you learn to talk to people, you learn to assess different situations. So it was a great training ground for what I did. Most of the people I've ever met who have that sort of background make friends quickly, are very affable. They just seem to be easy, go with the flow sort of people, happy go lucky. And I just think that you embody that. And I had no idea oh. that was your background. So very interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so are your folks still around? No, I mm. lost my dad. It's coming up on two years, first mm. of May. Sorry. He li- he when he retired, he stayed in Louisiana. And okay. my mom he and my mom divorced and she moved up here. So she lived oh. with us and we lost her about six years ago. So I miss him, you know. You, I was talking to somebody earlier today about the circle of life, and we talk about death as being such a loss, and it truly is, but we all know that day is coming. But for some reason, it seems to be the sort of thing that we just as a culture don't really talk about. And we all know we're going to lose our parents at some point, and nobody promises us tomorrow, so we need to seize the day, squeeze the day, carpe diem, whatever. Exactly. I agree 100%. Will you share with us some pivotal moments or experiences in your career that have shaped who you are today? Yes, I'd be happy to. When I think back about the things that were a big break at the time, um, I moved up here and worked for a magazine called Radio and Records, and uh, was happy to, that was to get my foot in the door. That was my first job at Music Row. But I met another journalist on a bus trip. <laughs> there was an artist way back. This is you know mid eighties um, on RCA named David Wills, and he was from Pulaski, Tennessee. They did this big hometown concert, and on the bus ride, they bust some journalists down there to interview him, see the show. On the way back, I met a, a journalist named Vernell Hackett, and she and I became good friends. And at R and R. I I felt like I kind of, it was a small office. There was only two of us, the bureau chief and myself, and I really wanted to write more. And Vernell saw that. And even though I was only, I think, like 25 at the time, they had an opening for an editor-in-chief at Country News Magazine. Mm. And Vernell was over two other publications, also owned by the same company, American Songwriter and Country Rhythms. And so even though I was young, and there are probably people a lot more qualified and had definitely been in town longer, she hired me for that Country News job. And just having somebody that had that level of confidence in what I could do and took time to mentor me and teach me so much, that was a real pivotal point in my career. You just can't, you know, say enough about the value of having a a mentor, somebody that that believes in what you can do. And that came back around again years later. I applied for a job at Billboard magazine. And it's funny because when I worked at the radio station, 
I used to love to read Billboard. I mean, all disc jockeys do, you know, and the reviews and like that was like, that was my goal when I moved up here. And there's a great guy. We're still really good friends. He was the managing editor at Billboard, Ken Schlager. We're still good friends. I love Ken. But Ken was a demanding editor, but he seemed to see that I had the potential and there was a job open and I started working with Ken, just doing Christian music coverage, and then eventually ended up full-time working in the here in the country office doing country and Christian. So, yeah, I look at getting those two jobs were really pivotal moments in moving my career forward. That's very interesting, and I really didn't know that you had started in the Christian music industry either, or the role Vernell played. So very nice to see how those connections have played out in your future. Thank you. As someone who's interviewed numerous influential figures in the entertainment industry, what are some common traits or characteristics you've observed among those successful artists? I think number one is like a strong work ethic. Hmm. People that, that work hard and that are not afraid to like go above and beyond what's expected of them, whether that's as an artist, as a, another journalist, anybody in any field, I think you just have to really over-deliver. Also, just genuine passion for what you're doing. Like, it's the people that love songwriting that are truly great at it. They just have that desire to communicate and to say something unique about the world in a way that nobody has. And to me, a great song makes everybody feel less alone. Like, don't you hear when you when somebody's expressed what you feel but you didn't have the words for? Mm. I just think that is just such a, I just, I have so much admiration for songwriters. So just that passion. And then the third thing, to me, like the people that truly succeed and have longevity in the music business, love people. Mm. Now there, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of artists that like don't necessarily, they're shy, basically. So it's hard for them to do the job requirements of, you know, being in the public eye. And that doesn't diminish from their music or their artistry. But I think that a lot of the people that Dolly, Dolly loves people. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, she really wants to make a connection. She has this genuine kindness. And on the acting side, Dennis Quaid, the first time I interviewed him was a phone interview, and my, my mom was ill at the time. He texted to check on my mom, and then when oh. she passed, I got the most lovely message from him about she was in the arms of Jesus and just, oh, I mean, and Dennis is somebody I had watched his movies for like 40 years, you know? So uh, to me, the people that, that win— in every area of life, the ones that are kind and compassionate and just truly love people and try to lift up others around them. I know Mm. that sounds kind of sappy to say, Susan, but I think that's so true. No, well, and you know, in life, you kind of, I think, find people who are maybe somewhat similar to, or you get those commonalities and you build on them. So that leads me to wondering, like as a journalist, how do you navigate the balance between reporting objectively and forming personal connections with the artist you interview? Oh, I'm laughing because I this I've struggled with this. Mm. Ah, I just do. Like I was trained at LSU, and I was trained through working with Vernell that journalists are unbiased. You know that is really truly the way that we are supposed to be, and to me, that's the gold standard. But it is so easy to be swayed either by the art itself, you know, when you just feel a connection to somebody's song or somebody's film or, you know, somebody's book or somebody's work. But then when you meet the person and they are just lovely and kind and it, it's it's really hard to remain unbiased. And my husband laughs at me because if I'm writing a story about somebody and it's somebody that maybe I didn't have that strong a connection with, it was a good interview, they were informative, they were kind, polite, but there was like no emotional connection. I can sit down, Susan, and pop that story off in no time. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's a job, you know? But if it's somebody that I just love, like Dolly, you know, or like a Brad Paisley, or, you know, people that I've been covering, you know, for years and years and years, I feel such a weight of responsibility that the reader feels like they had that conversation, that they, I mean, because as a journalist, you're the conduit between the person who's, you know, that you're interviewing and the reader. And I just, I take that responsibility really seriously. 
So that brings me to your new book. Your book is called Country Faith, and it delves into the intersection of faith and country music. What inspired you to explore that topic, and what insights did you gain from the research? And I can't take uh, take credit for the initial launch of the, that idea. Bob DeMoss um, was a publisher. Back at that time, he was at Zondervan. And I had heard through my literary agent that he was looking for a journalist to write a book. And the premise was, talking to country stars, what's your favorite scripture and why? And I thought, oh, my gosh, I would love to do this. So he set up a lunch with me and Bob, and I got I got the job. Um, so it was totally Bob's idea. And so I love getting to do this book because Christian artists get to talk about Jesus all day long. I mean, that's just part of the job. But there's, you know, most country artists, I wouldn't say all, but most country artists grew up, their first singing experience was in church. And their faith is very important to them, but they don't really have a platform to talk about that. Um, Because we did this book like 10 years ago. And that was when it first came out. And then Dayspring is our new publisher. And they're like, Mm. we need to relaunch this. And I was so excited, Susan, because there were a lot of artists that weren't around then. You know, Ah. so the new book, the first book had 56 artists in it. The new book has 70. People like Jordan Davis, who I just love. And then people that we missed the first go around that we just couldn't get by deadline, like Reba. She um, she wasn't mm. in the first book. She is in this one. And so I love that we have all these these new artists. There's just so many great stories of verses that, you know, everybody thinks of the Bible as this, you know, this ancient, wonderful thing. And it is. But it's a, you know, it's a living Word of God that is still impacting person after person in different ways today. Yeah, that's really neat. And I had no idea that the book had had a previous iteration and then blending that with some of the older iconic, you know, artists or maybe retelling their stories and then with some current day artists, I think is is a great tactic too. I'm sure you're going to get some great um, engagement with that book. Thank you. Yes. And we're working on a Christmas book for the fall. And this will also be the second Christmas book. We're going to have recipes and great old childhood photos. (laughs) Mm-hmm. One of my favorites is Alan Jackson sitting on Santa Claus's lap. I love that picture. And so the Christmas book will be out in the fall. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of country music. Um, over several decades since you've worked in the business, what do you believe are some of the most significant changes the genre has undergone, both musically and culturally? Probably the most significant change is just the diversity. And I think, you know, having moved here in the 80s, there was, you know, the whole you know, popish country, you know, the cosmopolitan sound versus the more traditional rootsy sound, which Randy Travis ushered back in. People always talk about the pendulum swinging back and forth in the music industry. It'll be really traditional, then it'll lean more pop and rock, and then it kind of swings back. And Randy is credited with a revival in traditional country music. And just kind of as an aside, when I worked at (laughs) R&R, Randy and his manager, Lib, owned the building, and she rented the bottom as office space. So back before Randy ever signed a record deal, like we would pay him like 25 bucks to like take out the trash, change the light bulbs, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. When he was he was working as a cook at the Nashville Palace, and then of course he you know finally got a record deal. And he was singing at the Palace as well, but he finally got his record deal. And I remember he signed like his first contract, like sitting at my desk because my workspace was clean. <laughs> That funny. Who knew? I remember when he used to play at the Palace in those early days. And he never changed. He's like, was all, the success never changed him a bit. Always the nicest, kindest, great guy, you know. That's but wonderful. back to your question, the diversity. I think, you know, there has always been, as I said, kind of, you know, back and forth between the traditional and the, the more progressive sounds. I don't think country music's ever been as diverse as it is today. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great thing. I know it's kind of controversial. And like, Personally, in my in my musical taste, I lean towards the traditional side of things, but I love the fact that when artists come in and ex, ex, you know express themselves, incorporating different sounds, hip hop and, and other influences, it brings a younger audience into the fold, and we need that. So I think there's room for everybody. It is interesting how things are kind of being blended a little bit more today and how artists from other musical genres are doing some country things too. You know, most recently Mm -hmm. we've seen that. And in the big picture, I do think exposing the music that we've all known and, and, and loved, even though it's evolved and 
maybe swung with the pendulum. Um, it, it is interesting, I think a super interesting time for it now. I want to go back just for a minute to thinking about early in your career. Are, is there some advice that you might have for people today, for young journalists or aspiring writers or journalists wanting to break into the field, and especially those maybe covering entertainment and music? Find a, a local publication and give them something they need. Like I said, when uh, when I was there in Shreveport, and I could, because I worked at the radio station, I could get interviews with artists, and then I would sell those stories, you know, Kenny Rogers is coming to town. Here's what you can expect from the tour. So it's, you know, everybody wants to start, like, doing the big acts and, you know, start at the top of the, you know, the game. But you kind of have to, like, start small, make inroads, and build. You know, it's, I tell people that all the time. It's like, I'm so thankful for the career I have, but this is 40 years of working hard. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, you just kind of have to, to put in the, the time. But like I said, I would, I would start locally and start building your bylines, you know, and reach out. There's a great uh, a book, the uh, Writer's Market, Writer's Digest, um, that kind of lists different opportunities with publications and stuff. Because especially online, there's so many more opportunities to write now. So just whatever you're passionate about, wherever, whatever you like to read, Try to make an inroad with the editor of that magazine or that website and pitch them stuff. When I went to work for the radio station, I had no radio experience. I went in, had my interview with the program director, and he looked at me and he's like, why should I hire you? I said, because I listen to your station all the time. I know what you do. I know I can do it, and nobody will work harder than me. Mm -hmm. So when you get your foot in that door, just sell yourself. Be prepared. You know, know what the, what that magazine or what that website or what that film company, if you're trying to get in, you know, entertainment in that end, know what that company does and then tell them how you can be an asset to them. So speaking of the audience and knowing the various publications, would you mind just sharing a few of the publications you're currently writing for? Because it's stunning. <laughs> Thanks. I am so blessed. I, I do a lot of different things. I, I have multiple bosses on any given day. Mm -hmm. um, I work with a radio show called Country Top 40 with Fitz. So I love working with them. I do interviews for them, you know, feed them content and stuff. That is a, one of my clients that is, is so much fun. I mean, they're just such a great team of guys. Probably the thing that keeps me busiest is Woman's World and First for Women. They are two weekly magazines that are both owned by the same company. And I love writing for them, Susan, because I have done like Tanya Tucker, Sarah Evans, Dolly Parton. I've done my usual country gals that I love. But I have interviewed chefs like Paula Dean and Emeril, Valerie Bertinelli, Rita Moreno. Oh, my goodness. Talk about, you know, talking to her. She's 90-something, and she is a firecracker. So it's been great to be able to write about all these different fascinating women for these women's magazines. I do stuff, too, for Jesus Calling which I love. They have a podcast, TV show, and a magazine. And like some of my favorite interviews for them have been with Andrea Bocelli. Oh, wow. I, oh I mean, that just, that was one of the highlights of my career. Um, Rita Wilson, Kristen Chenoweth. Those are kind of like my four, my four main outlets, the women's magazines, the radio show, um, Jesus Calling. And I do a lot of bio work too. Record mm. companies hire me to do short you know, bios that they send out with new uh, new music when it goes out. I love that. And particularly if it's a brand new artist, because as a bio writer, you kind of help them set their message. You're helping them introduce themselves to the world, what's important to them, what they're, you know, what's unique about them, because there's so many new artists and everybody's trying to cut through the clutter. So, yeah, that's just kind of a little bit um, in <laughs> what I yeah. do. No, no, that's that's tremendous. If this conversation is motivating you to squeeze the day, learn more about getting involved in your home community to deliver food, to volunteer, or to just get active. If you'd like to learn more, visit 54.org. That's F-I-F-T-Y-F-O-R-W-A-R-D dot O-R-G. There's so much to gain by helping others. Now, let's get back to our show. So I've got a question for you about your experience. What advice do you have for individuals over the age of 50 
who are either seeking to reinvent themselves or pursue new passions later in life. Do it. Just do it. That is one of the things, Susan, and, and the women that I've interviewed recently for Woman's World are first. They're like picking up a paintbrush again, something they haven't done in a long time. They're writing a book, something that they didn't think they had time to do. The overwhelming thing I hear all the time, it's never too late to do something that you're passionate about, something that you want to do. And one of the things, I don't know how, exactly how old he was, but Colonel Sanders didn't start his chicken empire until later in life. Hmm. You know, I mean, people, you can accomplish anything at any age. And if you try it at a more advanced age, all that wisdom and experience and passion that you bring to that launch, that's just so valuable. Hmm. No, that's a good point. I want to talk a tiny bit about health issues, too. I know health issues are not uncommon in our life journey. What advice would you offer to others based on your experience? You, oh, you're hitting something that's <laughs> personal to me. As a cancer survivor, mm -hmm. I fell and broke my back a few years ago. Like, yeah, I have battled different, you know, health situations at different times. And I would just keep working. Like the day I broke my back, I came home and wrote a story. You know, mm -hmm. looking back now, the world is not going to stop if I can't meet a deadline. So I would encourage people to take care of yourself and cut yourself some slack if you're dealing with a medical condition. Try to, you know, be fair with the people you work with and the people around you, but try to take as much time as you can to heal mm -hmm. and take care of yourself. Because I think most of us just feel like we have to deliver. We don't want to let anybody down, mm -hmm. you know. So I think a lot of us just push too hard. Yeah, no, good point. And I think that's something that's built into the DNA of most women I know. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about your family. You're married and have a grown son. And is he, I know that's a sense of joy, big joy. Oh, yes. Is he following in your footsteps? And do you have a proud mama moment to share? <laughs> No, he is. He's not following in my footsteps. I always thought he might do something in the music business, but he works for UPS. He's been with them ah. for 10 years. He makes great money, great benefits, and he loves what he does. He is just like, he's one of those guys that's usually dancing on somebody's porch. <laughs> he just, the word I use to describe him most is he's just joyful. He is always in a good mood. He's always been that way. He is just happy. He never meets a stranger. I'm just proud of him on so many levels. But probably the most recent example was I was working the red carpet in a film premiere uh, this past week for a movie called Unsung Hero about the Smallbone family, Rebecca St. James and her brothers, Joel and Luke, who have a duo called For King and Country. Great film. Anyway, we, uh, we didn't have a videographer with us that night, and I needed some somebody just to shoot some clips of the interview and Trey gave up his day off, stepped mm. up and did that. And he just, he it was so much fun getting to work that situation with him. He's just, yeah, I have so many proud mom moments. Like when, he, this goes back to when he was in high school, Susan, but he went to Antioch High, which is a really rough school. And we mm. kept wanting to pull him out and put him in a, a private Christian school. But he's like, mom, that's where my friends are. And they, because he was, he's six three. He's a big guy. You know, some of the rougher kids in school would try to start fights with him, and mm. Trey would just look at him and say, "You know what? I would rather pray for you than fight you, but I'll do either one if you push me." And inevitably, people would back down. He just wow. has always had this wisdom and this good sense of how to deal with people. And he, I'm so excited. He's getting married in the fall, October nineteenth, ah. to a girl named Rachel. She goes by Ray, so they're Trey and Ray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how sweet. How sweet. And maybe we should all think about that strategy. I mean, it's a really a psychological way to deal with conflict. Yep. Yeah. It was. Very smart young man. So uh, speaking of questions, I've got just a speed round of questions that we just like to get quick answers to. So what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> Listen to music. Like you would think because I do it for a living, I wouldn't be wanting to do it, you know, <laughs> recreationally. But like I love going to a great concert and I love all different kinds of music, Western music, rock music, everything in between, gospel, Christian, country, of course. My other fun thing probably that I do in my spare time more than anything is plan my next trip. So yeah. I love to travel. What's advice you have for your younger self? I wish I had taken better care of my body. Hmm. because my whole life I have not slept a lot. Hmm. Um, and now we're finding that is just very detrimental, of course. Hmm. Um, like when I was in college, like I said, I was doing the TV show, working at the radio station, took a full load of classes. 
back then, it was not uncommon for me to like stay up for 48 hours if I had too much stuff to do. Wow. And I'm to be honest, I'm still bad about that. There was like last week, there were two nights I didn't go to bed. Like I would catch a cat nap on the couch and go back to my office because I had overcommitted. Like I, if somebody asked me to write something and I'm excited about it, it's hard for me to say no. Mm-hmm. And so I'll say yes, and then there's just not enough hours in the day. And like I said, I'm I'm dealing with multiple clients, multiple magazines, websites, and I generally every day have something due for somebody, you know. I'll give you a prime example. Back when I was 28 years old, I fell and broke both bones in my leg really badly, mm. just mangled it. So I had to have two big rods and 11 screws put in the, the my right leg. And the doctor, I was in the hospital for a week. I mean, this was like a messy surgery. Mm-hmm. When they let me out, they're like, stay home, stay off of it. Well, I didn't do that, Susan. I went mm-hmm. to the CMA Awards. I rented a scooter. Oh, wow. <laughs> and this, at the time, it was a plastic hard, I mean, the plaster hard cast. And so I ran around backstage on my scooter, got my interviews, went home, filed my, you know, got my story done, everything. Well, at 3 a.m., my leg was swelling out of that cast. I had to go to the mm-hmm. emergency room and have it cut off. And boy, mm-hmm. the doctor was not happy. And said, stay home, you know. So, like, when I look back at stupid things like that that I did, that I should have mm. stayed home and taken care of that leg. <laughs> and instead, I was, like, out doing my job. Yeah, I, my advice to my younger self would be try to get more sleep, try to live a healthier lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Oh, one more question. What's on your bucket list? I have never been to Paris. I yeah. really want to get, yeah. So that's kind of our 40th anniversary is next year. That's something I would love to do. And grandkids are on my bucket list, like with my yeah. son getting married in the fall, and I think they want to start a family pretty quickly. I'm looking forward to that. Um, the other things, um, writing more books. I'm working on a book now with Dionne Warwick, oh, wow. um, which has been just really fascinating. She is something else. What a legend. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, you're going to have to get the, um, after the, Paris after the Olympics and before the grandbaby, that's when your trip needs to be, I'm thinking. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So um, what is one piece of advice your parents or an older adult might have shared with you that at the time you thought was silly, but now that phrase rings true in your everyday life? I think just the value of hard work. Like I think when Mm. you're younger, you're just like, oh yeah, I'm going to work hard. You don't really appreciate how much working hard and being fair with people is going to take you. Mm-hmm. Um, and another piece of advice, just to kind of slow down and enjoy the moment. I know that sounds very cliche, but I started out young journaling, and then I got so busy. I haven't done that in years, and I think that's something I'd like to to get back into. But yeah, just savor every moment, because depending on what your career is, most careers nowadays are just so fast-paced, it's hard to just appreciate what just happened. So that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's something that I heard a lot from my mom was like, you just need to slow down and enjoy it, you know, but I was always pushing for the next thing. Mm -hmm. So our last question is, what is it that you do to squeeze the day? That's a great question. I try to make a point every day, whoever I'm encountering, to compliment them and try to make them smile. If it's somebody who has great nails when you're going through the drive-thru, you know, see somebody in a grocery store, or if it's somebody that I'm interviewing, it's a new artist, I know that they're nervous. I try to to squeeze the day by just trying to make somebody feel good. I feel like the world is a hard, stressful place. And if we can make one another smile, I think that's so important. And then, <laughs> this is funny, sometimes you just want to take the, the low, you know, maintenance route, squeeze the day and just get in a good nap. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's <laughs> You know, sometimes you just, uh, you ever just feel like you've hit the wall and it's like, okay, I just need 20 minutes and I can get back after it again. Mm. And then just in being in nature, like I love to sit on the deck and watch the birds and watch my cat watch the birds. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's a lot cheaper than cable too, I'm sure. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing your inspiring story with us. Oh, thank you, Susan, for having me. Well, my pleasure. And as I leave you today, I'm sending you a big squeeze. Until next time. Squeeze the Day is made possible through listeners like you. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us continue to share inspiring stories of older adults 
and visit 54.org. That's F-I-F-T-Y-F-O-R-W-A-R-D dot O-R-G to make a contribution. And now I challenge everyone listening to go squeeze the day. <laughs>